Hello everybody in Greylin. this is Rob Hopkins here of Transition Network and it's such a delight and an honour to have been asked to send a few words to you on this auspicious, glorious occasion of your 10th birthday celebration. So congratulations, I'm delighted to hear you're having a party, it's really the best thing to do uh, uh, under the, these circumstances. And uh, I was asked to share a few thoughts and you sent me a few questions and... Uh, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, I don't fly, I gave up flying in 2006. Uh, I spend a lot of my time travelling around Europe by train because I think it's really, really important that people who are kind of leaders in the climate change discussion actually walk their talk and find a different way of, uh, of getting to places. So I spend a lot of time doing, uh, sometimes I feel a bit like Osama Bin Laden sitting in his cave sending videotapes <laughs> around the world of presentations that I do. But when I, uh, but, but, but I find that it's, uh, I, I think it's really important. So sorry not to be there. But uh, it's wonderful to be able to even to, to use this medium to be able to speak to you all. And actually, I remember one of the things that really struck me when we started doing Transition, and um, we were just doing it here in our town in Totnes, and um, uh, there were no books out at the time, there were no films out. I had my blog, and that was about it. And I remember somebody sent me a link to a video on YouTube, uh, which was quite young at that time, 2005, 2006. Someone sent me a link to a video of a woman in, in New Zealand, in, in, her, in her village hall in New Zealand, giving a presentation about transition to her community, saying, hey, sh should we do this? And it was really great, and she really understood it, and it was just fantastic. And, uh, and uh, that was only really possible because of, because of this kind of technology. So, uh, so it's nice that we can still use it to, uh, for, to, to connect uh, as a movement around the world. So you sent me a few questions to reflect on, and, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. And one of them was how we got started, how Transition started. Um, I'd say probably like, like most things, it started here in Totnes, uh, in the pub, actually, meeting somebody in the pub. I hadn't lived here very long, and I met somebody who uh, was also interested in climate change and oil depletion and local economies. And at that time, you didn't meet many people who were interested in that sort of stuff. So when you did, you tended to sort of hang on to them and say, um, oh, what are we going to do then? You know. So it was a guy called Naresh, and we started showing films and giving talks. And uh, after about six months, people started to stop us in the street and say, OK, we get all that stuff now. What happens next? So uh, so we did what we called the official unleashing of Transition Town Totnest, which was kind of the, the idea to, to really get it going, to, to say, right, OK, here's our idea. We can't do it on our own. We need you. What do you, what do you think? You'll now find transition groups in about 50 different countries around the world. Uh, and actually New Zealand was one of the first places outside of the UK who, who really got excited about the idea and uh, so it's so wonderful that after 10 years you're still going and you're still doing things and the beautiful book that you've just produced for your, for, for your party in order to, to share those stories and to celebrate what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, as I say, you'll now find transition groups in about 50 countries around the world. I think of it as being like a, a network of story that what we see is uh, a network of people who are doing stuff in their place and sharing those stories, whether they work, whether they don't work. A lot of my role in this whole movement has been about uh, storytelling, you know, looking out for the really cool stories and sharing those stories. So, uh, so, so thank you for, for the stories that, that you've contributed to this movement. They're all really, really uh, valued and treasured. Uh, I was asked how has the transition movement affected local agriculture, economics, democracy and education in various parts of the world. Um, I don't have very long so I can really just kind of give you a, f a few short stories I guess. One of the ones that I love the most is a place in Belgium called Liège which is an industrial city and they started doing transition in 2010, 11, something like that. I went about five years ago where they had just come up with this idea they called Centur Alimentaire which means food belt. The idea was how could the city build uh, uh, within a generation's time a new farming system immediately around it that would supply the majority of its food. Brilliant question. And I went there for an event four years ago where they invited baristas and academics and farmers and anyone who cared about food at all came to this event. Uh, and me. And, and then I went back, I didn't hear that much, and I went back after four years, about eight months ago now, and during that time, they'd started 14 new cooperatives. They'd raised 5 million euros in investment from local people. Uh, it was just fantastic. They'd started two new vineyards, a brewery, 
a pedal powered delivery business around the city centre, uh, a business growing mushrooms, they had a local currency, uh, they had a farm that was producing a lot of the food, and they started these two shops called Les Petits Producteurs, which means the small producers. And um, these, these shops were just units in the centre of the city, which they painted white, they put the food out uh, straight from the farmers, they paid the farmers what the farmers needed to be paid, and they just had food out in boxes, you went around, you helped yourself, you weighed it, and it told the story of the farmer and, and the crop next to food. Really simple. And uh, I met the mayor of the city, who was called Willie de Mayer, which was for, uh, like, you de man, no, you de man, no, you de mayer. And he was a really lovely guy and so excited. He said, eight years ago we wanted to be a smart city, now we want to be a transition city. This is our story. Our story has changed. We, lo we own a lot of land around the city. We're making that land available to Centur Alimentaire to lease at a low rent to young people who want to come in and start food-based businesses. It was so exciting. You started to get a sense of what it looked like when when the culture of a place starts to change and the story it tells about itself to the rest of the world starts to change. Um, and when I was there, I sat in the back room of Le Petit Producteur with Pascal, who's the manager of the shop there, and I said, how far can this go? How, where could this go? And he used this beautiful word that doesn't really exist in English. It's a French word. Uh, he, said, um, he said, I think by the time we open 10 of these shops, the supermarkets will start to fragilise. Fragiliser means to, to, to sort of break up. But fragilise is such a beautiful word. That idea that rather than campaigning against supermarkets and lobbying Amazon to be shut down, maybe we just create something else and uh, which is better and tells better stories and where the food is better and where people can see the benefits to their place. And... Uh, and the, the other economy just starts to fragilise, and that's, that's what the shift looks like. So that was really exciting to see that. I think it's really important as well to, to note that, you know, I could, often when I go to give talks, people want to hear about the big projects like Liège or the Bristol Pound or these big transition things. Actually, for me, it's really important to say that the small things matter just as much. The gardens on the streets, the repair cafes, the... The, the film clubs, the, those sort of things that happen are just as important because they're, they're people's way in a lot of the time. We often imagine there are people here who know loads about climate change and, and, and can't sleep at night because of it and are really active and doing loads of stuff and people over here who know nothing about it and so they don't do anything. And we imagine that all it takes for the people here to get to here is that they see a sufficiently miserable film and then they're going to somehow magically leap from here. To, it just doesn't happen. What happens is people need steps so they might need to maybe get involved in a food growing project on their street and then once they've been involved in that for a couple of months they start to think wow this is great I know so many more people I feel so much more part of this place I feel really connected uh, uh, I've got a lot more friends and I feel more more hopeful about the world maybe I might take another step and do something you know that's kind of how we get people in not not just imagining they're going to leap to being uh, completely involved in, in transition stuff um, one of the things that, that I would point to in terms of democracy and local government stuff is that Transition Network recently created a, an offshoot called Municipalities in Transition. It's a project that, we've, that we run because we're now seeing so much interest in transition coming from local government, municipalities, who are really fascinated by transition and also from transition groups who want to really build a bridge to the local government and also from people who have been involved in transition and then who decided, right, if we really want to accelerate this, we need to run for local government, we need to get onto the local government. And there's so many stories of that now that actually this organisation is pulling those together. If you have a look on their website, Municipalities in Transition, you'll find a lot of case studies, a lot of stories of that happening around the world. And that, that, that bit where, where top down meets bottom up in a way where they're both pushing in the same direction, that's really, really exciting to me. I guess a lot of the stories that I see and the bits that really excite me is, is, is where you start to feel that transition is not a sort of step-by-step -step linear change process. It's more like you inoculate your community with mycorrhizal fungus culture. And this culture then spreads through your place. And sometimes it fruits in places you expect, sometimes it fruits in places it doesn't, you don't expect. And I'm sure that's been your experience uh, there in Grey Lynn. You know, this idea that you, you, you let it go where it wants to go. And then there's a kind of a serendipity to it that's just really, really exciting to see. I see it here in Totnes where now we have two projects which together will build over 100 homes uh, for local people in housing need. Uh, all powered with renewable energy using local materials. You know, we start to really frame what we do 
around, well, what does this place need? Which I think has been a shift since we started, where maybe it was more like, what do we think the planet needs? Or what do we as activists think this place needs? Actually, there's the shift to saying, well, what does this place feel it needs? And how can we do transition while doing all of that stuff? Uh, which, which I find really exciting. I was asked, what has kept transition groups alive and well around the world? And I think there's a few different things. You know, I, I really want to salute uh, those of you who have put your time and energy into making Transition Graylian a reality and, and, for, and for lasting this long. Because, because it's not, I would never ever portray transition as being easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of evenings. We could be doing other things with, you know, it takes a lot of time. But we do it because we feel like that's what this time in history calls us to do that that's this is what we need to do in order to be of service to the world at this time um i think i think one of the things that that, that tends to differentiate groups that that stay together is that they pay a they pay attention to how they do things as much as what they do. They pay attention to how they work as a group, how they manage burnout, how they support each other, how they make decisions, how they manage conflicts. That more kind of people-centered side of things is just as important as the as as the as the projects that we do. And it's one of the things that I think transition does really, really beautifully is 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 making that making that point and pointing to the importance of that. You know, making sure that our groups are as resilient as the projects that they're trying to do. I think having a having a sense of direction. Where's all this going? You know, actually, what we're if we're, if if we're just doing small projects all the time. You know, there, there needs to be this sense of yeah, we could take a step up and then we could start to be building this new economy. We could create a community energy company. Maybe we could do some 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 building. We could we could start this. We could start that. We could you know moving it up from being the the, the from, from that early manifestation of transition. Like in the book Transition Companion, how we identified these different stages that transition goes through to the point that we call building, where you are building the new economy, you are putting in place the new infrastructure that the place needs. Having that sense of direction, I think, really, really helps. Celebrating our successes is so important because we don't do it very often. And I noticed when I started to get in transition after a long background in activism and campaigning that I'd never been involved in anything that ever won. And it was such an unusual experience when we started to do things that actually started to, 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 to succeed, it was like, oh, this, this, this is quite an unusual, actually feels quite nice, this, I could get quite used to this. So, so I think there's, there's that side of it as well, that, that we need to be celebrating what we do. And so I'm really delighted that, that you're taking this time at your, on your 10th anniversary to have a party, to reflect on what you've done during that time, to pat each other on the back, to acknowledge, to recognise, to celebrate what you've been doing. That's just absolutely fantastic. And then I was asked, how do I see the future of transition? And I, I would always say to that, I have no idea, because I had no idea when we started that 10 years later, I would be sending a video to you guys in New Zealand who've been doing amazing things for that 10 years. You know, this is something that has its own energy and its own momentum. I think for me, that I'm currently halfway through writing a new book about imagination, which is saying, actually, those spaces that you guys create where you invite people around you into a safe hopeful space to say okay what kind of future do we want to create what would it look like tell me the stories of it describe it to me what would it smell like what would it feel like if we got this right and then using that to actually go and do something always in the context there's a woman in america called mariami kaba who's a, a a campaigner for prison abolition and she says she says we must imagine uh, while we build always both and uh, and I loved that. So for me, it's about the the creating those spaces for imagination, allowing it to flourish because there are so few other places in the world today where that can happen. And uh, and story stories gathering stories. I my hope would be in ten years time that actually transition would be uh, the economic story that people tell. That's what we want to do. Our future as we see it is more local, more resilient, more connected. And uh, there's so many examples of it up and running around the world. No one can say it doesn't work and it just starts to become the norm, really. So my time is up. Um, it's been such a joy to be able to share something with you on this auspicious occasion. So from, from, from Totnes in England to you there in Grey Lynn, I raise a uh, fairly cold cup of tea to wish you a, uh, a very happy birthday, to offer you my deepest, deepest gratitude for all that you have done during this time uh, and to wish you all the best for the next 10 years and I look forward to being able to say something at that occasion too. Thank you. Bye-bye.